So apologies, I am a software vendor. I will occasionally talk about my company, but I'll try and keep it in the background. Focus on uh, two things. Uh, what is the CNCF and why does the native matter? It's reasonably introductory. I hope that will be the right level for everybody. And then a little bit about GitOps, which is what we work on, which is an interesting thing because it helps you to do cloud native applications. And if you want to read later, I've put these links on here. Well, the slides will be distributed so you can go and do some reading if you like. So who are we? We're a venture-backed company, been around for about four years. The company was founded a few days before Kubernetes, which was very timely. And uh, we believe we can help software teams develop software more quickly, but also more reliably using these new technologies. We have a team in Germany, if you want to move to Berlin. Also London, San Francisco, we actually distributed team. And the history of the company, we worked on open source projects like RabbitMQ, Spring, Ubuntu before. And now we work on projects like Kubernetes, Prometheus, Cortex in the CNCF, and the Weave open source project. And we have come up with new ways of working as we've done that, because we run these technologies ourselves. We don't just sell them. We actually eat our own dog food, as the American saying goes. And we discovered that there was a set of practices, which we call GitOps, nice simple word to remember, or operations by pull request, which I'll talk about today, which helps us to operate all of these cloud native tools in a way that makes sense and is secure. Okay, so who has heard this word, this buzzword, as it was described by Bjorn, thank you, before cloud native? Have you? Good. Okay, it is kind of a buzzword. Um, it was sort of coined about 10 years ago uh, by when people started seeing uh, Netflix. They started building new kinds of applications. Netflix was originally selling DVDs over the internet. And they decided to sell films over the internet without a physical DVD. So they decided to make the, the films available online. So you would just sit down, hi, Jamie, sit down and watch a movie on your screen. And at the time, that was kind of a new, rather scary idea. Um, but of course, it's everybody, so it works now. It's anywhere, turn on your phone, your, t your computer, so you have a connection. It's, the film is just there. This is incredible customer service. And it's how they make money because they have this concept of the moment of truth for the consumer. You sit, what am I going to do after I'm tired? Should I open a beer? Should I read a book? No, let's watch Netflix because it's easy. It's just there. So this high availability at global scale is what all of the ideas that go into Cloud Native came from, companies like Netflix and Google and Facebook and everybody else. And now they're being democratized so that everybody can do it. So it's easy for any business to do this. The Cloud Native Foundation is part of the Linux Foundation. The Linux Foundation was created in the 1990s to be a home for Linux, a legal home, so that people who contributed to Linux knew that Linux would always be safe from corporate capture. It's a trusted third party. Uh, I'm sure there are similar um, entities in Germany, probably parts of the government, for example, neutral places which are not controlled by one business, where you can contribute software in this case, and that software can be maintained, protected legally. If somebody attacks it for patent reasons, those can be defended in court, playing some of the roles that would normally be played by a software company. And the CNCF created three years ago to be the home of Kubernetes. Who has heard of Kubernetes? Who here is using Kubernetes? Oh, good. OK, about 25%, I would say, maybe 20%. Kubernetes is something that Google created. Um, now it's worked on by Amazon, Microsoft, IBM, Cisco, and about 300 other companies. Um, it's been described as planet-scale infrastructure, which is, of course, useless to anybody. Who writes planet-scale infrastructure? Nobody. But the internet is planet-scale. Some of the ideas that go into the internet, some of the ideas that go into Google's data centers that make it possible for them to run a global business are in Kubernetes. Ideas like scalability, automatic deployment, the idea that you can do several deployments at the same time and pick between them, which is... For most people, incredibly new. All of this is part of a cloud-native revolution. 
All of this is part of the Kubernetes technology and a family of other technologies. Um, Kubernetes is open source, and the picture, well, actually, this you probably can't read, but at the top, uh, it says, according to the CNCF, Kubernetes is the second largest open source project just behind Linux. So it's, it's been around only four years, it's already overtaken every other open source project except Linux itself in terms of uh, size. And compared to other technologies that sort of kind of do similar things like OpenStack or Cloud Foundry, many, many more people are actually using Kubernetes. So that's another important thing. Not only is it open source, not only is it automation and scalability, but people actually use it. Who here uses OpenStack? One guy. There you go. Two, two one. Well, I'll talk to you afterwards. <laughs> now, OpenStack is a good technology, but it's just not as popular as Kubernetes actually in real world use. And CNCF is not only the vendor neutral home of Kubernetes, but also other projects. And we're building a family of projects. We're supporting distributions. We're tracking contributors. We're helping people to learn about Kubernetes. You can go take an exam uh, and work on it. Some, one of the guys who wrote the exam is actually outside of the container solution stand, if you want to talk to him. And there are meetups and memberships. Here's a list of the current projects. Uh, it's about 25. Uh, there's some in the, uh, something called the sandbox, which is like a kind of kindergarten for early stage projects. Uh, okay, who here has heard of Prometheus? Good, that was written in Berlin. Uh, who here has heard of, um, let's see, Envoy? Not so many. So you can see there are some that are very popular, some that are less popular, and some that are new. But eventually all of these technologies will become probably in the forefront equally, a couple way to the wayside. So why this matters from a business point of view is we've got to stop writing infrastructure, okay? Now, I can see around the room that not all of you are at the first day of your career, but one day there will be cohorts of developers through who don't write infrastructure code anymore. Just like probably not many of you build computers. Does anyone still build computers in this room? When I started in technology, I actually started in a university, then I went into a bank and worked in a bank for a while. And then after that, I went into technology. In about 2000, 2002, people were still building their own computers then. People don't do that anymore because unless you want to make a gadget to put you know, some sort of display in your shoes or some other cool thing, basically building data center computers just doesn't make sense for individuals. It makes sense for Facebook, it makes sense for Intel, it makes sense for all kinds of people, but it doesn't make sense for us. Writing your own operational infrastructure doesn't make sense. You should be focusing on business applications. But it's been very difficult to get to this point. We're now starting to see that we can do this in the future. So we need a common platform, a set of tools for, for, for these applications that makes it easy to write applications to run in the cloud, which is now pretty much everywhere. And to accept, make it simple to try like machine learning or drones or cars or all the other kind of cool stuff that we want to write. So to illustrate this point, I will use the tired but fun analogy of Lego. Uh, who here uses Lego? Last week in Britain, a minister of the government said that he likes to relax using Lego. So there you go. It's still popular in some circles. Lego is a system of components. That's the key point. I can get some Lego. I can go and see my friend who has some Lego, and we can build a Lego thing together because they're components. They fit together. So we can do things like this. This is a, I've been to this place. It's in England. But it's not what you think it is. This is Legoland in England. This is a drive, a car you can drive, really. It doesn't blow up. This is an actual octopus. I don't know what that is. And this is kind of where the CNCF was at in, in 2016, when it was founded. It was just some ideas and some, some pretty bricks. But now we can build simple things. We can assemble, because we've got multiple components, Kubernetes, Envoy, and other projects. We can ass start assembling applications. 
And our goal in the CNCF is to build that common cloud platform for you so that you can make money from building new things. You can do the next Amazon or the next Yahoo. Maybe that's not a good example. OK. And you can do it faster. And I will illustrate what I mean by this in a moment. Some people hate this word. Somebody, Brian Contrill, said last week, developer velocity. It sounds like you're throwing them. Well, I'd like to throw some developers. But this just refers to the overall throughput of development and how much you can do in, say, a year with a certain team. And this has changed very, very quickly. Who here did a Hadoop project in 2013? Anyone? It's the OpenStack guys again. Just kidding. This is an actual photograph from a Hadoop project when they had armies of consultants being assembled to take on the big data project, which would take years to do of Death Star proportions. Today, if you want to do machine learning instead of Hadoop data analytics, you can go and download something and run it on Kubernetes right now. It takes about 30 seconds. This is why we like to use the Lego analogy, because it's so quick to assemble these cool things. And I was very happy to see outside the giant swarm team who've got Lego all over their booth. Of course they do, because Lego is cool. But it's really cool to say to your boss, let's use machine learning. And the boss says, why? And you say, because here's a demo I wrote last, last week. It took me 30 minutes to do to prove to you that we can get value from this so you can start spending money on it. That is so much better than spending nine months with three different consulting firms, just trying to figure out which Hadoop to pick. And so this concept of componentization is closely related to velocity. Here's an example. Um, in China, people build skyscrapers in under 20 days now. Can you imagine that? This is a photograph from the, the Guardian newspaper in England. It's actually a photograph of a video, but uh, I can't play that for you now. But this is a 57 skyscraper that is built using standard components, standard techniques, to create a unique but pretty standard building that anyone can use in almost no time. That's incredible. Imagine if we could do that with technology. Wouldn't it be great? As a counterexample, here's a book which in, there was, do you, who knows the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? OK, good. Douglas Adams, who wrote it, said about somebody, left to his own devices, he could not build a toaster. He could just about make a sandwich, and that was it. To illustrate the incompetence of somebody he was describing. And a man read this, a man called Thomas. And he read this in the book. And he said, I know, I will build a toaster. And he decided to build a toaster himself using non-standard components. Everything had to be sourced from scratch. No plugs from the shops. Everything was built by hand. And he built it. It took him a year to build, and he turned it on, and that's what happened, the photograph on the front. So that is, you can do it this way, or you can do it this way. And so platforms of assemblable components Enable speed, velocity, throughput, call it what you like. You get things done faster. You get things done faster, look at what you can do. You can build new things like, you know, spaceships or whatever, octopus, art, the Big Ben. Now, when I last showed this slide, I had a lot of people on Twitter complaining about it and saying that I was an idiot. So I apologize. Nothing in this slide offends you. These Stats are taken from the Puppet State of DevOps report a couple of years ago, which is now more recently that all of the people who worked on that have, have, have something called Dora. And they published a book called Accelerate, which I highly recommend reading, about continuous delivery and proving to your boss that adopting it means that you can get things done better. Who knows what continuous delivery is? Good. If you join Facebook, I've heard that if you're a developer, you can start on day one, and they'll let you deploy a change to their running systems. Wow. Even if you're fresh out of college. And they let you do that because they can deploy them instantly, and they can roll them back instantly. Or rather, they can overwrite them. Continuous delivery is the overall approach of making it possible to make changes 
from your source code to production systems whenever you like in such a way that you can always repair them. That's probably not the best definition, so don't quote me on that, but it's, it's, it's a pretty accurate description. And when you start doing things continuously, you start making lots more per day, which means that you can start changing really small things and making experiments instead of sitting there going, what are we going to do in six months' time when we roll out our data center change? What's our rollback strategy, as people used to do when I started working in the IT industry? So you can start to do things like customer testing. Whoops. You can say, hey, what if we had a blue screen instead of a red screen? Or what if we put the pixel over here so that somebody could press? Will we get more people clicking the button if we move it? Also, you can recover from failure much more quickly because everyone is habituated to making changes fast to fix things. People used to think that if you, if you made a system that was very easy to change, it would be unstable. And that would mean that it was unreliable. What we found is that the systems that are nailed down and hardened to make them reliable are the hardest to fix after things have gone wrong. Yes, OK, maybe they don't go down so often, but when they do, all of those things that made it difficult for somebody to change it make it hard for somebody to fix it. Systems are chaotic. Do you know how the eye works? Who knows how the eye works? Who's the eye which is, do you, do you, when you focus on somebody, if I'm looking at Jamie now, are my eyes pointing directly at him and fixed? No, actually, apparently, they're constantly moving and correcting themselves. That's how the eye keeps track of a target, using um, feedback mechanisms. And that is essentially how stable systems at places like Google and Netflix work. They have a team of SR site reliability engineers who know how to constantly keep a system back on track. It's like playing a computer game. And so you get faster recovery from failures, quicker rollout, and so on. And so this is the, the world we're looking for, one where more developers write more code that powers serve applications and services for businesses on standards using continuous delivery. And the, the platform might look something like this. So you've got this Kubernetes thing, then you've got some other projects like monitoring, logging, and so on. You've got your own stuff. It all sits on somebody's cloud or a data center. And those bottom four boxes, that's your platform. So if you work for, you know, mega corporation number three in Stuttgart, that's great. You know, some Porsche or somebody, uh, you can have a Porsche platform, and that will have some standard components and some of your components collectively, all of your developers will deploy Porsche applications to the Porsche platform. By the platform, that's the goal. And the key point is the code that they write could be quite varied. We can't predict today what it's going to look like in the future. People tried this kind of concept. It's, with Cloud Native that started kind of not just with Netflix, but also Heroku. Heroku came about because it was hard to run Ruby applications in the cloud, but it was very easy to write Ruby applications. Make it as easy to run them as it is to write them. They came up with a single platform as a service, as it was later known, which you just push code into the platform and it runs it for you. Only certain kinds of applications, so-called 12-factor apps or web apps, could work in Heroku. And uh, of course, they've expanded it a tiny bit, but it's still quite restrictive. You know, what if I want to write a back end of a car service? Is Heroku the right tool? Probably not. There's all sorts of reasons for that. What we want is to have a platform on which other people can innovate, and we don't know what they're going to do. Heroku forces you down a certain path. So we want a new kind of platform that lets you choose. And this is kind of where we're going on that. It's, this is kind of looks like one of the agenda slides that was shown in the introduction. You know, we're in the middle of a process. We're not there yet. We're working on security right now and storage and other things. The, 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 the happy world of you run your code on any kind of app on the Magic platform isn't quite there yet, OK? Kubernetes is still quite hard to use, for example. When I asked how many people are actually using Kubernetes, about 20 to 25% of the people in the room put up their hands. And I'm sure that's partly because it's quite intimidating and complicated. But we'll get there. And then we'll have the just run my code, hooray. <laughs> OK. Practices. I'm going to talk about practices next. Let's have some water. 
Is this going at the right speed? Does anyone want me to speed up, slow down, dance? I'm not going to do that. So new ways of working. One of the things that happens with platforms is something called co-evolution. This concept has been popularized by Simon Wardley, among others. But it, the ideas go back quite a long way. The, the idea that when you have a new set of tools, you figure out new ways to use them, and those become the practices, the best practices. And then you have effects where you see generational changes, where you see a tribe of often younger people who say, we've got to work in this way. And then there's a tribe of older people who say, no, that's the wrong way to work. And it becomes a kind of division, social division between them. But it's really about people wanting to identify with a new tool chain and the new practices. And they sometimes wear different clothes. You know, in, when I worked in banking, there was this bold new idea of dress down Friday. In tech, you have dress up Friday, because obviously we look like slobs most of the time. And that's deliberate, by the way. OK, so to summarize about the cloud native stuff, cloud platform powered by the new open source standard tools runs on any cloud, but is available as open source. You should see an explosion of higher order tools and services, like Kubeflow for running machine learning, just as one example and best practice, which we call GitOps. So what the heck is GitOps? Uh, imagine if everything in your world as a technology person could be described in a repo. Not a running system, but a repo. A model for the whole system. This concept was pioneered in the 90s by people like Mark Burgess with the concept of promises. My Microsoft with a model-driven data center. If I had a description of how things should be, then I can check between reading the description and what I've written out in my running system. And if they're different, I can fix them. So GitOps, we have discovered at Weaveworks and others have discovered that it is a really good way of not only operating Kubernetes, but also the applications and services that run on top, because you can describe them. And I'll show you what I mean by that in a minute. And then you can apply those descriptions, enforcing them as policy on the whole system. And if, they, if the system is different from the enforced policy, you can make changes. And somebody described this as very usefully as the holy grail of software and infrastructure. Isn't that nice? So GitOps is obviously meant to sound like DevOps, and indeed does build on at least a decade of best practice in DevOps, infrastructure as code, um, agility, et cetera, all these things that people have been talking about for a long time, and applies them through the lens of tools like Kubernetes, Terraform, and other tools that tr strive to support declarative infrastructure. And it has benefits which you can actually talk about, like Sarbox compliance. May, may, many of you probably work in companies where compliance is important and you have audits. If you have a system description and you make changes to the system based on changing the description, that gives you an audit trail, provided the tool that you're using is irrevocable. So Git is such a tool. You can do Sarbox compliance audits using Git. Um, you can also go faster. This is a company in the US, uh, about 40 people adopted GitOps, and it doubled their overall productivity for fixing bugs, adding customer features. So that was the trend before, and they just had a huge leap in the change, because they found it much easier to make changes. And once they had confidence in the simplicity of making changes, they found it easy to roll back. And once they knew they could roll back, they could make any number of changes per day that they wanted. So they, they started off with one or two releases a week, and everybody would stop work and watch Jenkins, which would be quite a long time. And then they would stop, and Jenkins would sometimes work, and sometimes not work. And if it didn't work, people were never quite sure what state it was in. So they would have to go back and start all over again. They couldn't continue pushing through to converge state. Kubernetes and the tooling like it supports convergence, which means that you can tell it, hey, here's a description. Just keep trying until you've got to the right place. 
And we have tooling which we gave them to support that way of working, and it got these results, which is pretty powerful, especially if you imagine that scaled across a much larger team. It really is a money saver, a time saver. And we're seeing many people adopt it, this way of working. It's not just one set of technologies. There's also patterns that you can, you can build for yourself if you want to. Financial Times, Ocado, the British supermarket, um, Intuit, the uh, big international payments company, Chick-fil-A, 8,000 restaurants in America, powered by GitOps, and so on. I think this is an appropriate image given where we are at the moment, car industry. GitOps is automation for cloud native. It's based on the idea that if you can describe something, then you can automate it and control it, provided you can also observe it. Build to plan. It's building on DevOps, config as code, using version control to track changes for purposes of change logs, rollback logs, audit logs, all kinds of logs, social logs. And it's applying that to really the whole stack, the machines, the clusters, the apps, the containers, the lot. So we talk about Git as a source of truth. We have one single description of true state of the system, or sorry, true desired state of the system. And then we have a control loop, which works the same way as the eye tracking the position, the feedback loop, comparing the actual state that is observable with the state that is intended. And then it tells the convergence tools like Kubernetes, hey, go converge, get me back onto the right track. Or I'm making a change to my intended state. I'm doing a deployment. Hey, I'm gonna, I want to have 10 containers instead of five now. Go do that. Or hey, I'm going to auto scale. So you decide how many containers we need based on this property. And if the states are different, what's written down versus what's observed, then you fire a diff. So everything is driven by diffs. What this means is you can hire a developer, put them on the project, and if they know how to use Git or any tool that talks to Git, because Git's a pretty shitty tool, okay, they can do work on your system. This is great. Day one productivity. And you can validate what they did, you can roll it back, you can audit it. There's some other benefits too. So how does it work? Who has seen one of these before? I'm hoping it's exactly the same people who put up their hands and said they're using Kubernetes, okay? Otherwise, <laughs> I'll see you afterwards. For some act series of historical accidents, uh, many tools today have ended up with this particular format called yet another markup language, YAML, for describing um, facts about a system. It's not a very nice way to do it, but it is um, something that is processable and vaguely readable, so it's us usable. It's a protocol for specifying infrastructure. And we don't necessarily want humans to actually edit this, but it's something that you can do if you need to. But more importantly, it's very easy to build tools that, that can adapt it. And Kubernetes and many other parts of the new cloud native stack work by having these kinds of descriptions. Lots of cool new tools appearing which let you do this in a more natural way, using code and so on, but they're still underneath it work in this way. So with this new platform from the CNCF, we want everything to be described. So we can operate everything in the same way. Because by developers who know Git, performing actions through that tool. That means Git is the system of record. You force changes to go through Git. Doesn't mean, as I said, doesn't mean you have to interact with the Git UI necessarily. In addition to having everything being described, we also want everything to be observed. You all hear people talking about observability. If you watch Twitter, if you don't watch Twitter, you'll be thankfully probably ignorant of all of this. But people are talking about observability instead of monitoring these days because there's a more general concept of health of a system, keeping an eye on it, being aware of the overall state of the system. Who here has heard of gray failure? No? OK. So a gray failure is, a, a failure is when all observers agree the system is broken. A gray failure is when some, but not all observers, agree the system is broken. So one person might be aware that things are about to go bad, but everybody else is happily going about their business, which is the normal state of real life. I mean, the financial crash in 2008 is a great example. 
a couple of people in 2007 are going, oh no, things are about to go to hell. Everyone else is writing happy newspaper columns about their holidays. And then suddenly, a year later, the world is ending in all the newspapers. Because failure doesn't all occur at the same time. It doesn't occur at once in complex systems. Observability is about developing tools and practices to understand what's happening in systems both before things go wrong and to understand what's going wrong, going wrong once they start to go wrong. And also to debug them. And if you do uh, operations by um, encouraging people to use best practices like modern automated systems, you discover very quickly you're not quite sure what changes you've made. Okay, because it's like, oh, wait a minute, I gave this asset to the platform and it's running it somewhere, but is it really running it? Has the tree fallen in the forest? In the old days, you could install software on a machine using install shield or something like that, and it would tell you that it was there, and you can go read it in, a, in, the, you know, in your C drive or something, and it would say, hey, here's your .exe file, and you can run it, check that the software is there. Now you have to ask the system if it thinks it's running something, which means you need a different way of checking that deployments work, and you also need to be able to check if they are having a positive or negative impact on your system. Otherwise, you can't iterate quickly. You'd like to go, I'm going to make this change. Is it going to make things better? I'm going to measure it this way. This is my definition of how things will be better. Let's very quickly compare my measurement with my deployments so I can decide if, I should, if I've made the right deployment or if I've made a bad one, I need to roll it back. This is all why we need observability. And so at Weaveworks, you know, we've been doing this for some time, three or four years, operating Kubernetes and all of the things around it. So we are eating our dog food very heavily on this. Everything that I've talked about today, we do. It just works very well. Um, so some of the uh, key points, you get a, model, a good way of thinking about your system. You get the ability to roll back quickly. You can use code review tools to see who changed what when. It's good for compliance. And it's a way of bringing humans into the software process. And you should really apply it to everything that you do, not just clustering, but things like dashboards, for example. Because if you make a change to a dashboard, that might be correlated to a change to another part of the system. How would you know, unless you tracked it? OK. So just to finish up, I'll compare the GitOps approach with another approach, which we call CRops, which is when you push changes into your system from Jenkins. Now, Jenkins is an amazing tool. Many CI tools, CI server tools, are, are really quite powerful, interesting things for orchestrating a build process, running tests, smoke tests, all kinds of cool things. But as many people have spotted, they are a threat to your system if they have direct access to production. You need to be very careful not to let somebody own your CI servers and then own production. So if you let Jenkins do operations, you could be opening yourself up to problems there. We think there should be a firewall, ideally, between the CI world and the deployment world. So you shouldn't really talk about CD as one thing. CI is one thing, and deployment should be, should be pull, pulling into the cluster, which GitOps lets you do. Here is a typical CI CD pipeline where everybody can talk to everybody, and if somebody gets in anywhere, you are in security hell. A GitOps CD pipeline. You can see on the right, running cluster is protected. It's only allowed to talk to the registry. No one's allowed to go into production. Humans should not use SSH. And you have read, write, access only through the config repo. So you have this separation of concerns. A pull model where the cluster makes, becomes aware of changes because it's watching the registries and the repos and the config files and updates itself if it has to, but the build tools are not allowed to talk direct to it. Instead, they update the registry. So it's like having a bulletin board where everybody can say, hey, I think we should do this, make this change, because you're updating just the desired state. OK, now that I'm glossing over a few details about who has access to the repo, for example, and, and many other things, but, but the key idea is sound. You separate build from production this way. CI tooling has no production access. The CD tooling retains the production credentials. Developers can't push directly to the image registry. Cluster API credentials are never exposed. Do not do that. 
So this is a picture of this. Kind of the summary of everything about GitOps, and I'll probably leave you with this. You've got two life cycles, okay? The life cycle on the left is your continuous integration life cycle. You want, to go, you want this to go as fast as possible. You want to use the best possible tools you can. Jenkins from CloudBees, Travis CI from Berlin, Circle CI, then you GitHub Actions, there's so many cool tools. You should be able to pick and choose which ones you use. So long as you put things into Git as an update and your image repo and the other immutable repos. And on the right, you have another life cycle, which is the operational one, which is driven by automation as much as possible with human intervention allowed. And that watches the desired state and it updates itself. And that's how it works. So all intended operations are committed by pull request. All diffs are automated and can lead to convergence or an alert. And all changes have to be observable. And that way, we can unify deployment, monitoring, and management into a single, simple operational path that's secure, because you can't get from the left to the right, which is pretty damn cool. Thank you very much.